Okay, please be seated. We'll get started. Welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Center's European Program and the Center's History and Public Policy Program. And it's a pleasure uh, and privilege to welcome all of you to this session, uh, but in particular to welcome Professor Mary Serrati, author of 1989, The Struggle to Create Post-Cold War Europe, and of course, General Brent Scowcroft, uh, who is joining us today as our distinguished commentator on this panel. Uh, uh, the Wilson Center every now and then features important uh, new relevant books, and certainly um, Dr. Serrati's book, 1989, um, very much fits that category. We're delighted to have her here as a longstanding partner of the Center's Cold War International History Project that many of you are familiar with. She is currently Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California and presently also a fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. She's got a long list of publications to her credit, including, of course, a book on dealing with the devil, um, a publication on German military reform and European security, and most recently, the uh, 1989, The Struggle to Create Post-Cold War Europe, which she just told me won the 2009 DAAD, German Academic Exchange Service Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in German and European Studies. She has also served as a White House Fellow and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. We have the great honor and pleasure today to be joined by General Brent Scowcroft, uh, uh, General Scowcroft is currently the president of the Scowcroft Group and, of course, one of the country's leading experts on international policy. He has served as national security advisor to both Presidents Gerald Ford and George Herbert Walker Bush from 1982 to 1989. He was vice chairman of Kissinger Associates, an international consulting firm. His prior extraordinary 29-year military career began with graduation from West Point and concluded at the rank of Lieutenant General following service as Deputy National Security Advisor. His Air Force service included Professor of Russian History at West Point, Assistant Air Attaché in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, Head of the Political Science Department at the Air Force Academy, Air Force Long Range Plans, Office of the Secretary of Defense for International Security Assistance, and a number of other important uh, positions. Uh, he continued uh, his service, his public service, um, in, um, by serving on the President's Advisory Committee on Arms Control, on the Commission on Strategic Forces, and on the President's Special Review Board, also known as the Tower Commission. So, serves on a number of important councils and commissions. I won't list all of them here. But let me conclude by saying that very much in the Wilsonian tradition, he also combines uh, scholarship. Um, he has earned master's and a doctorate in international relations from Columbia University and is co-author with former President Bush of A World Transformed. I think Mary and I could not think of a more distinguished, more appropriate commentator for her talk today about her new book. Mary, congratulations. The floor is open for you. We'll proceed. Um, Mary will talk a little bit about her book, then we'll have comments by General Scowcroft, and then invite questions and comments from all of you. Conclude right about 5 o'clock, at which point I'll invite you to a small reception across the hall. So, Mary, Great. welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Scowcroft, for coming today, and thank you, all of you, for coming out today. Uh, I am just going to try to talk very briefly, about 15 to 20 minutes, about the argument of my book, and then we will let one of the important participants to take part. Is the microphone not working? Yes, yeah, it, it is working, but speak closely. Okay. Into, uh? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's Excellent. Better. Good. So uh, my book uh, is um, not an end of the Cold War book. Uh, which you might think it is, given the title. Uh, the main question of my book is something slightly different. I realized in the course of researching what was originally going to be a larger book, 
on the Cold War, that there were an extraordinary number of documents available from the years 1989 and 1990. A number of the people who were involved, most importantly Helmut Kohl, but also Mikhail Gorbachev, had decided to release their documents from this time period, which had then inspired other people, uh, like the uh, Bush Library, uh, James Baker, uh, the keepers of Margaret Thatcher's records, Francois Mitterrand's records, to release theirs early as well. So I realized that it was already possible to do good Cold War history, good international history on this time period, even though you can't do that yet for the late 70s or early 80s, even though we don't have the sources for that yet. So you can leapfrog over other time periods, but already use historical methods to work on this time period. So once I realized that, I realized the sources available from for 89 and 90 were very rich, and indeed much richer than those from the 80s, the rest of the 80s. I thought, well, what does this inform what's most in interesting about this information? And what seemed interesting to me was what it revealed about the construction of political order after it is comprehensively broken down. Uh, when the Berlin Wall comes down, when the known order clearly ceases to exist, what does the day afterwards look like? How do you reconstruct political order out of chaos? So that was the question that interested me. Uh, this was a slightly different question than that which had interested other scholars. Uh, so in other words, I am looking at 1989 as a beginning, not as an ending. And so I wanted to understand how we got the international political order we have today and not any of the other ones. So what I'm going to do today is just remind us briefly why 1989 matters, what was at stake. I'll ask you to try to uh, remove your hindsight uh, and try to think back to the time. And then I'll talk about competing models of order. What happened when I read the documents is that I saw again and again that policymakers in many languages and many countries used the same phrases to describe what was happening. They used the language of architecture. Uh, the Americans talked about a transatlantic security architecture. The Germans talked about a Germany under a European roof. Mikhail Gorbachev talked about a common European home. Lots of use of the phrases blueprints and construction. So I decided to follow the lead of the historical actors and adopt the language of architecture as the organizing concept for the book. And it became apparent to me that a useful way to think about 1989 and 1990 is as an architectural competition. In other words, it's very competitive. There's a lot of people who have different blueprints for the future. They're competing with each other to be chosen, to get their blueprint to be the one that will define the future. And I found that the metaphor even worked well when you extended it, because uh, if anyone, any of those of you who have been involved in the architectural world at all know that if you win an architectural competition, that doesn't actually mean that you're going to build anything. The losers will sue you, uh, the city will sue you, the site will turn out to be not appropriate, there'll be all kinds of pushback, and so there'll be all kinds of problems with the building permits, so there are all kinds of implementation issues that are separate from even the competition. So I realized this was a useful way to think of this time period, and it came very much organically out of the material itself. So I'm going to uh, present uh, different models for the future. Uh, I just want to say these are topologies. I'm not assigning probabilistic values to them. In other words, I'm just trying to show that there were alternative futures. I'm not saying they were all equally likely, but there were credible alternatives out there. And looking at them helps us to understand the alternative that won. So then I'll talk about which model wins and we'll just very briefly what the consequences are. I'll just really summarize that and I can then we can discuss that more in questions. So on 1989, we all know that it turned out peacefully, uh, but that was not obvious at the time. Uh, if you remember uh, when uh, the, there were similar protests in Tiananmen Square, here you see the goddess of democracy staring down Mao. Uh, this story did not have such a happy ending, of course. Uh, on jo June 4th and June 5th, the People's Army removed the people from Tiananmen Square. Here you see the famous picture from the morning of July, uh, sorry, June 5th, which ironically was the same day that semi-free elections in Poland started the process that brought solidarity to power. So you have to remember that there were possible violent negative outcomes in everyone's mind in this time period. So 1989 matters for a number of reasons. Uh, it decides whether communist regimes will defend themselves or expire violently, leaving bloody scars. It also decides whether central planning is a viable method of running an economy. Alan Greenspan has described 1989 as the single most important day in global economic history because in his mind it definitively settled the competition between communism and capitalism. 
1989 uh, then raised the question, once it was clear that matters in Central Europe were in flux, of whether Germany would unify or remain divided. Also opened up the question of what, what would happen to the European community. Would it, in this window of opportunity, seize the chance to integrate more fully, create a common currency, or would that somehow happen in the distant future when Eastern Europe was considered to be ripe for it? Finally, the big question about 1989 is, of course, security institutions. Uh, would NATO persist beyond the end of the conflict that created it? NATO is the quintessential Cold War institution. It was designed to contain the Russians and, that, and, the, and, the, and the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet threat starts to disintegrate, is there a justification for maintaining NATO? If so, what is it? If not, is it going to cease to exist? Uh, is it going to stay where it was? Is it going to expand? What is going to happen to it? This is not clear. And what happens if the bipolar division of Europe ends? How far does integration extend? Does it extend across the Urals? Does it extend to the Pacific? Does it include Russia? So these are all open questions. And so I'd ask you to forget that we know the outcome to these and try to put yourself in the minds of the people who are trying to find answers to these questions at the time. In other words, the people who realized that this old map of Europe, and in particular this border, that that map was going away. And there was going to be some kind of new map, but they did not know what it was going to look like. So try to have that uncertainty in your mind as you listen to me describe this competition. So in order to answer this question, I decided to focus on a narrow time period, which is to say 1989, a little bit of 1988, but really 1989 to 1991, but to try to look at it from the perspective of all key actors. So I personally, and this was enormous fun. I'm very much going to miss this book. It's quite sad to me now that it's done. Uh, there's no more grant money to go to another exciting capital. Uh, but for about four to five years, I was in uh, Russia, I was in Poland, Germany, England, France, here in Washington a number of times. I thank my friends in the audience who let me sleep on their couches over and over again. Uh, it was a great ride. And so basically it meant that I was able to look at pretty much all of the key actors. And on top of that, I had the great good luck of being able to do interviews. Usually, by the time you wait for really high-class primary sources to be available for you as a historian, that means you no longer have the possibility of talking to the actors. But because, as I mentioned, these documents were released early, I was able to interview General Scowcroft, uh, Secretary Baker, Lord Hurd, uh, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, Dennis Ross, Horst Telchik. There were about 30 interviews that I did. And you can see the list in the book, which you can buy in the lobby. <laughs> so um, the, it, that was my research design. And as I said, I used to keep to basically make sense of an enormous mass of material, I use this metaphor of an architectural competition as the organizing framework. And so I have set up the book as a competition between these blueprints for the future. And so I'm just going to very briefly describe the models very rapidly. If it's not clear, I'm happy to talk about it more in questions. A little bit about why uh, the fourth one wins, and then uh, we'll um, hear from General Scowcroft. So the four models, and I'll explain what I mean by this in more detail, are the restoration model, the revivalist model, the heroic model, and prefab. Now, I should add that there are other models as well, but these were the four that occurred the most, had very significant backing, and seemed to me to have some possibility of succeeding if circumstances had been a little different. Uh, restoration is an architectural term, meaning uh, it's almost kind of a Disneyland effect. It means to build something that looks exactly like you think it looked before. Uh, those of you who have perhaps been in the Hotel Adlon in Berlin or the inner city of Warsaw, the idea is not to innovate. The idea is to recreate something exactly like it looked before. And this was very much the initial Soviet reaction, which initially had some support from the British and the French, which was to say 1989 is 1945. The Second World War has finally ended. Uh, we are the four occupying powers in Germany. We are now going to end the Second World War, have a peace conference, talk about reparations. Uh, we're going to do this just the four of us. So this is an assertion of quadripartite authority. In other words, the Germans are not involved. Uh, so these four powerful nation states are going to dominate the process. Uh, East and West Germany were horrified. This is one of the few things that Helmut Kohl and Lothar de Maizière agreed on. They said, we cannot let the four powers treat us as a province in the year 1990. So Helmut Kohl responded with the revival model. 
The revival model, revivalism in architecture is something different. That means to take an older architectural style, but to update it for a new purpose. Uh, the US Capitol, of course, is evocative of Roman architecture, but inside, of course, it looks very different than a structure in Rome would look. So Helmut Kohl said, let's revive the idea of a confederation. Now, in the past, German the area known as Germany had had many different forms, many different little entities consisting under a shared roof of uh, German language and German culture. His idea was, let's reconfigure that with just two Germanys. Now, this will last a long time, well into the 21st century, a number of decades, certainly. And these two Germanys will maintain their independence in that time, but eventually they will grow together. So this was his response to the restoration model, is to propose a confederation where over the decades, slowly the living standards would come to match, and then the two Germanys could be unified. Uh, the response from Mikhail Gorbachev is heroism. Now I need to add that in architectural circles, the word heroism has a, a different meaning than it does in popular parlance. It's a much more ambiguous term. Uh, it's a term that describes huge skyscrapers that dis perhaps destroyed well-established neighborhoods when they were uh, put in. It's a term that implies uh, a sort of being somewhat foolhardy, unrealistic. It applies to a number of misguided design exercises from the middle of the 20th century, often explicitly in the service of authoritarian regimes. So this is something that's, that's vast, but often ill-defined and impractical. And so Mikhail Gorbachev started building on this idea of the common European home and proposing a, a, a variety, it kept changing, it never got specific, but a variety of institutions that in essence would unite the Atlantic to the Pacific, uh, cooperating, uh, European states would cooperate. The key element that linked all of this is that it does not include the Americans. So this is a pattern uh, that the Americans obviously are not happy about and that West Germany, Helmut Kohl, who at this point is working very closely with the White House, is not happy about. So Bonn and Washington working together uh, choose the solution of prefab. Now, again, I need to say that this term is slightly different in architectural usage than it might be in popular usage. By saying that what happened was prefab, I don't in any way mean to say that it was cheap. As a matter of fact, prefab is very much in vogue right now in architecture as a way of uh, looking forward to sustainable design that uses less waste when you install the structures because you know what you're doing. Uh, so by prefab, what I'm trying to say are structures that were already known, that already existed, that were prefabricated in the West. The idea is that you take tried and true institutions, uh, such as not only NATO, but the Grundgesetz, or basic law of West Germany, which was supposed to be a temporary document that would become invalid when Germany unified, uh, but in the meantime uh, had been uh, recognized as the best constitution Germany had ever had, and no one had any desire to let it become invalid. Uh, the Daymark, the currency of West Germany, take these uh, uh, institutions of the West and install them in the East. This has the advantage that you don't have to waste time coming up with new ideas of what to do, but the disadvantage that these are all things that are conceived for a divided world, for a Cold War world. And so the question is, will they really work when you move them to a new location? So what are some of the elements of prefab success? Uh, well, um, it has to do with the fact that even though many nations contributed to the demise of the Cold War order in the past, the future of Europe was largely shaped in the negotiations over German unification. In other words, I saw very clearly in my research that there was a very strong dichotomy between the people who caused the end of the Cold War, Solidarity, Neues Forum, Mikhail Gorbachev, Ronald Reagan, uh, and the people who created the post-Cold War order. That was a small group of people, one of whom is sitting in the room here today. Uh, another, a number of other ones were in Bonn. A few were in Paris. So there was a, a dichotomy between the people who brought down the Cold War order, which was much more international, Hungary, Poland, and so forth, and the construction of post-Cold War Europe, which was very much a German-centric event. Uh, the, so people power destroys the status quo. Uh, this is, as I said, a more international event. It becomes clear that the Soviet Union, in contrast to 1953, 1968, and so forth, is not willing to pay the price in bloodshed necessary to restore that order. It's clear that a new order is needed and quickly. Uh, and Bush and Cole and General Scowcroft understand that Gorbachev's authority is unstable. 
Uh, here he is at the Malta summit, the so-called C6 summit, at the end of uh, in early December 1989, on ships tossing in the stormy ocean seas around Malta. Uh, even though there's still this, you know, appearance of, of parity between the superpowers meeting on an equal level, even though he's not only Time Magazine's Man of the Year but Man of the Decade. Uh, in fact, Washington and Bond are very clear on the fact that there are challengers such as Yeltsin. Uh, that his hold on office uh, is uncertain, that his tenure may be short, that the rising forces of nationalism, which of course eventually caused the Soviet Union to fracture, are going to make his time in office very short. And given that he is about the best possible conceivable leader from the Western point of view, it's hard to come up with a leader of the Soviet Union who would be better from a Western point of view. It's clear that you need to get whatever you want done done while he is still in office. So there is some extremely skillful negotiating, uh, particularly in Moscow and in Ottawa in February 1990. Um, it turns out that Gorbachev, for his enormous vision for all that he did to bring freedom to the peoples of the Soviet Union, turns out to have been not a very good negotiator. It was basically outclassed by the Americans and the West Germans. And also, uh, Helmut Kohl, having convinced Gorbachev in February uh, to allow him to unify Germany internally, then turned around and campaigned in the March 1990 East German elections, in which it is important to note he was not even a candidate, because at that point he's still a foreign national, because he's a West German. This, however, did not stop him from giving six major campaign rallies, uh, which were attended by so many people that he realized at the end of the 6-1 he had personally stood in front of a million East Germans. Uh, and basically his theme was, was very simple, vote for me for the CDU or vote for my affiliates in East Germany at the CDU and we will give you the Daymark as quickly as possible, we will give you the Grundgesetz, uh, we will basically give you the structures of the West. And that proved to be very successful. Uh, one thing that emerges from my book more strongly than in English language literature to date is what a central role Helmut Kohl had. Uh, one of my reviewers said I made him sound like Bismarck. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Uh, <laughs> but he certainly ended up being a very significant figure and worked extremely closely with the White House in this period. It's, it's extraordinary. Uh, there are times at which he was attending White House meetings on sort of a three, every three weeks. It was really quite extraordinary to see that cooperation. He worked very closely with President Bush, uh, with um, Secretary Baker, uh, uh, Horst Telchik, his aide, worked with closely with General Scowcroft. So there was a lot of cooperation in this period. And the enormous success, and unexpected success, I should say, the last time there had been free elections uh, in uh, East Germany, which had been uh, just before the Nazi era, so at the end of the Weimar era, uh, they had gone to parties of the left. So there was an assumption that they would revert to that habit. And therefore, the fact that Kohl came very close, the CDU came very close to winning an absolute victory was seen as a huge mandate. And so the architectural competition phase was then over. It was clear that prefab had won. So then you had the phase afterwards of trying to actually start building, and that required the permission of the Soviet Union. Even though the Soviet Union was falling apart, it still had 380,000 troops in East Germany, and it had four power occupation rights. So Germany, no matter what it wanted, could unify neither de jure nor de facto without Soviet permission, regardless of the situation at home. Uh, so there were a series of carrots and sticks used uh, to actually get the Soviet troops out of East Germany. This was a very touch-and-go thing. The Soviet troops in this period were not getting paid re regularly, were not eating regularly, had their dependents with them, 200,000 dependents. They were selling not only um, pieces of the barracks and wiring for cash, they were selling guns, ordnance, and tanks for cash. And so these were armed men, very unhappy, uh, and not at all clear that they would have obeyed Gorbachev uh, if he had perhaps give, tried to order them not to use violence. Uh, one of the things I discovered is there was a brush with a stage of terror where Stasi agents in intentionally tried to make the East German Revolution violent in the hopes that the Soviet troops would then come out of their barracks to defend them and there would be massive chaos in East Germany and that would require the reassertion of four-power control. So uh, just to wrap up, this is the end. The, uh, you can see the European community extending uh, into the east. And uh, the, it's fortunate that this happens quickly because, of course, then Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, 
and this then, of course, pushes Europe off of the agenda of the Americans. So then you have uh, President Bush is no longer focusing on Europe. He is focusing on the Gulf. So just to wrap up, the prefab model wins. Germany unifies successfully. Uh, Europe negates the violent Chinese example. The brush with the stage of terror does not develop. Uh, Europe expedites uh, the development of its common currency. That's Mitterrand's bargain. Mitterrand agrees to this in exchange for an expediting of the process that creates the euro. The EC and NATO both begin to extend, and Russia is left on the periphery of Europe, uh, and then thereby generating great resentment of NATO and failure of Russia's own prefab. So I've just given you an overview of the sense of the book, but I would be happy to address more of those issues in questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, uh, especially for taking us quickly through what's a very complex and very rich narrative. General Scowcroft. Thank you very much. May I start out by saying this is an awesome piece of research, and I commend it to you. I can't say I have had an opportunity to read the whole book yet, but I've thumbed through it, and I am impressed, uh, having lived through most of these things, with the depth of the research that, that Mary has done. It is a terrific job. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say at the outset is I've forgotten most of what happened. So uh, I, I, I learned a lot from some of the passages in, in her book, which I had completely forgotten. The one thing I would like to impress upon you is uh, I think the architectural model for what happened is a neat device and it allows you to make order out of a lot of things that otherwise are kind of incomprehensible. But I'm not sure how close to reality it comes because each side, this wasn't like sitting down, we know exactly what we want. We want a building to do this and that and the other and what are the designs? <clears throat> It is partly that. What do we want? Well, in a way, we all wanted the end of the Cold War, whatever that meant. But in addition to what we want, what really don't we want? And that differed sharply among the parties. Uh, and the United States started out when President Bush came into office uh, it, very simply a number of commentators, some people from the Reagan administration or so, uh, so on, was saying, the Cold War's over. Well, we looked around, and uh, certainly the rhetoric was different. Certainly Gorbachev was saying different things. But what was the Cold War? Well, we decided that the Cold War, in essence, was the division of Europe. And that division hadn't changed a bit, really. The lines were still there. We tried not to call the satellites satellites anymore, but Soviet troops were still in full occupation. So the rhetoric was different, but nothing else had changed. So what do we do? So we, we decided, first of all, that we needed Gorbachev to demonstrate that he really was different in fact and in motivation, not simply in rhetoric to lull us asleep like was partly done in the period of detente, where we tended to take detente seriously uh, and uh, decide the Cold War was over, and it wasn't. Uh, so we started out wanting to take advantage of the ferment in Eastern Europe. There was definitely one of those periods, like East Germany in 53, Hungary in 68, Czechoslovakia, or, uh, Hungary in 56, Czechoslovakia in 68, and so on. We wanted to take advantage. This was another such period. But we, wanted to, we tried to learn from the previous periods because each time there had been this upwelling of liberalism in Eastern Europe, the Soviets had come in and cracked down, uh, uh, killed most of the leaders, and thus set back reform time. We wanted to avoid that. So what we sought to do 
was to encourage the liberal movements in Eastern Europe, but at a pace that under that under that which the Soviets would be compelled to respond, either by cracking down in Eastern Europe or overthrowing Gorbachev because he was a weakling. We didn't know what that pace was. But that's what that's what we set out to do. Uh, Gorbachev, I think, was had something different in mind. Gorbachev was trying to, in a way, modernize the Soviet Union, not democratize the Soviet Union. They were falling behind. The creaky model was not producing what they needed to be able to continue to compete with the West. He wanted to rationalize it, increase productivity. So he had a campaign against absenteeism, against drunkenness, against corruption, and against the repressive society which stifled initiative from the workmen. What he didn't realize is he was undermining the system. Now that was sort of what was taking place in Eastern Europe. So Gorbachev turned to the little Gorbachevs in Eastern Europe and turned back to his conservative party people and said, these guys are ahead of you. Come on, shape up. He even had party elections for some in the Soviet Union. Not that he was in favor of elections, but to demonstrate that this was a new world and the Soviet Union had to be able to compete. The British and the French, I'm not sure what fundamentally motivated them, but one of the motivations was that they really did not want a new Europe, or an old Europe in the sense of a reunified Germany. As a matter of fact, I think it was, I don't know whether me, I think it was uh, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher said, I like Germany so much, I think there ought to be two of them. Uh, so the motivations going into this were, were very different. So people were trying to push their own idea, but trying to avoid what other people were pushing. The last actor in here, which is very important, was events themselves. And especially events in East Germany. We had tended to think that East Germany was the pillar of strength in the Soviet system. A hard-working, dynamic society that was the engine of the system. It turned out it was a hollow shell. And when the collapse started, it went so fast that everybody's architectural plans were thrown out of kilter. And events took over and there was a lot of, of ad hocery. Uh, now the events themselves in East Germany uh, really started with Gorbachev again. In October of 89, the GDR was celebrating its fourth, 40th anniversary of independence. And there's all this liberal ferment in Eastern Europe, except in Romania and East Germany. And Gorbachev was going to go to this celebration. Now, what was he going to do? Was he going to undercut his own position by supporting Honecker as an unreconstructed hardliner? Or was he going to walk away from him? Well, Gorbachev went, and in kind of typical Gorbachev style, he didn't do either one. He put his arm around him, but he didn't endorse him. And that really started the decay. The rest is a lot of accidents. The wall itself, well, I have to, I have to back up a little. Uh, in the summer of, of uh, 89, uh, the East Germans, who were allowed to go to vacation only in Poland and Hungary and other places in Eastern Europe, uh, started to flood into the embassies in those countries, the German embassies, and asked for asylum. And the embassies were full, 
And the Hungarians finally opened the border to Austria. And the, and the East Germans started to pour through. That started a real crisis. That really started the crisis in East Germany. Uh, and uh, they eventually barred the Germans from, uh, from leaving East Germany. Uh, but then, in November, uh, the new East German government, after Hanukkah had, had fallen, said, well, we're, you know, we can't close the border anymore. That's not humane. We're going to open the border, sort of. Uh, they didn't say whether it included the Berlin portion or not. And the wall came down sort of by accident. Nobody knew exactly what was happening. But uh, uh, once it did, uh, Helmut Kohl realized that East Germany was a hollow shell. And he quickly came out with his plan for unification. That was not a general German plan because the Germans had differences of opinion just like we we had in the United States. And Hans Dietrich Genscher, who was the foreign, uh, the foreign minister, was also the head of the Free Democratic Party. And uh, uh, he and he and Cole had rather different ideas about how to proceed. Well, Genscher's line of communications into the U.S. government was through Jim Baker, the Secretary of State. So Jim got his ideas about what was happening in Germany primarily through Genscher. My channels were through uh, Cole's uh, national security advisor, and and we had very different stories to tell the president about what German thinking was. So this was a, this was a a complicated situation. And then the precipitating incident was uh, when President Bush went to a NATO summit after the seasick summit with Gorbachev at Malta to report to NATO on his uh, meetings with Gorbachev. And the night before the meeting started, he and Cole had dinner together. And Cole laid out his vision of a unified Germany. And uh, the president had not declared himself to me, I don't think to Jim Baker, to anybody else about where he stood on this. Uh, <coughs> I was much more leery of unification than was Jim Baker. The Germans were divided upon it. I knew on it. I knew the French and the British were opposed to it. Gorbachev was opposed to it, and I didn't want us to be put in a position where all three of them would gang up on us and all of our plans would be stifled. So I wanted to proceed slowly. And the president had heard both of us talking about this. Helmut laid out his vision, and the president listened to it thoughtfully, and he said, Helmut, I'm impressed with what you have presented to me, and I'm impressed with you. Go for it. It was just really that simple and direct. And that focused our efforts. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of complications which Mary has gone through, which I won't even, uh, e even touch on. But that, that focused our efforts. And, and principally, we were trying to avoid some things. We were trying to avoid the Soviets being in a position to block things. So I was against the two plus four because the Soviets were a part of the four and I thought they could block it. Uh, we were also worried about the Russians, the French, and the Germans getting together through the two plus four to block unification. We were also very concerned about a Europe which would not include the United States, uh, which would mean that whatever you think about the end of the Cold War, 
the Russians still had massive conventional forces, even if they pulled out of Eastern Europe. And if we weren't there, and if NATO wasn't there, then we had a very vulnerable situation. So, yes, it was retaining institutions that were built for a different purpose. As a matter of fact, we're running the country and the world with institu all of them with institutions that were built, not for the world we're facing now. Whether it's the Defense Department, uh, the CIA, or the intelligence community, NATO, the UN, they're all built for a world which is which is past. But the the results I think on the whole were unusually good. And we operated with some skill and a lot of luck. And we were lucky in Gorbachev. If there's a hero in this whole thing, I would say it's Gorbachev in this sense that he he was not a particularly crisp, decisive leader. And that gave us the opportunity. You know, he didn't want a unified Germany, but he didn't have, he didn't want a neutral Germany necessarily. He did want a neutral Germany, but the notion of a, of a neutral Germany again in between East and West in Europe drew up bad visions for everybody. But Gorbachev, if instead of Gorbachev, the old men of the Kremlin had appointed another Brezhnev, you know, the Cold War could have gone on for quite some time. I mean, the system was sclerotic. It was gradually decaying and descending, but it didn't have to do it when it did. And Gorbachev, by his actions and inactions, I think, was... Uh, key to it all. Well, I could go on, but I'm not going to. We welcome your questions, and again, I urge you all to get the book. It's a fascinating read. Thank you, General, for taking us back 20 years. The floor is open for your questions in Wilson Center tradition, and for the benefit of our viewers online, the session is being webcast live. Please wait for the microphone and then state your name and affiliation. Yes. My name is Stephen Shore. I'm with the PBGC, a wholly domestic federal agency. My, there was one, one name that has not been mentioned is Edvard Shevardnadze. So my question is, did he have any independent contribution? Was he uh, simply following uh, Gorbachev's lead? And if he made a contributions, exactly what were they? Uh, the, he... There's a tension between Shevardnadze and Chernyev as advisors to Gorbachev, and at times Chernyev prevails, at times Shevardnadze does. Uh, Shevardnadze is particularly important for his links to Genscher. And uh, as the general has said, there is tension between Genscher and Kohl, so there is at some point a question of could, could Shevardnadze play on that. So there's a sort of very complicated game that's going on. It, it's difficult to summarize in a few minutes here. But uh, his contribution is very much towards keeping the process peaceful, keeping the process cooperative. There are people who are tearing out their hair in despair, like Valentin Falin, that Gorbachev is not taking a harder line. Uh, he has advisors saying that he should insist on Soviet four power rights. He should call a, a peace conference to World War II. He should use all kinds of obstructionist measures. And Shevardnadze is very much more a voice of reason. I would say that Shevardnadze comes the closest to being the Democrat in this whole thing. Uh, it's my impression that Shevardnadze tended to keep Gorbachev on the path of reform. Uh, and not only on domestic, but on foreign policy as well. Uh, and, and it wasn't so noticeable while he was there, but when he left office, Gorbachev's behavior changed dramatically uh, toward the hard line. Uh, he became much more difficult to deal with. He started pulling back, for example, on Kuwaiti issues where we had been closer together, and he started to fall off more on, on the European issues. So I think, uh, I, I, to me, Shevard Nazi was, uh, was a strong and, and very progressive figure 
in this whole issue. Thank you. Sam Wells, and then we'll go to Diego. Well, this is a fascinating exposition. Mary's laid out a uh, very imaginative structure. Brent's talked about a chaotic, fast-moving process. I'd like to pose a very artificial question to you both. If you had one prize to give out, let's call it the Woodrow Wilson Prize, for creativity in st and statesmanship in working through this whole process, who would be the recipient? Brent's tipped his hand a little, but it, mm -hmm. in this context, he may choose to uh, revise his remarks. Uh, do you want to go first? Oh, I have to go first. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, it, I, it, it's, I think that uh, the prize for creativity has to go to Helmut Kohl. Uh, the book very much emphasizes the role of Helmut Kohl. Now, that's not to say that the same thing as canonizing him. I mean, there, is some, there are some gloves off power politics, uh, in, in, and it's uh, you know, the old saying, you don't want to really want to see treaties and sausage being made. Uh, you know, it's not to say that he was a saint, but uh, he, at some point, hears, there's a German phrase that, that you, to hear the, the coat of his, history rustling by. And uh, he heard the coat of history rustling by and realized that he could grab onto it and be the Chancellor of German unity. So I would have to say, to help a call. Well, I'm very prejudiced on, on this. You know, uh, I pointed out Gorbachev uh, in it because without Gorbachev it wouldn't have happened. But Gorbachev was not necessarily, he was not the decisive mover on this. He was, he was the reluctant drag along with it. Uh, I think uh, I don't think Cole was quite as Machiavellian as, as Mary does. He was, but he was very good. And and I I would say I'd give a joint prize to <laughs> Cole and Bush because they got to understand each other very well. They communicated very well, and once, once President Bush was confident that Cole was trying to create a Europe, not recreate a German empire, that he was a good European citizen, and that's what his goal was, then he gave him wholehearted support. So it, it was that symbiotic relationship, I think, that produced the results. Just say the question depends on what the prize is for, if it's for destroying the Cold War, which is more Gorbachev, or creating the post-Cold War order. Thank you. Diego? Hello, my name is Diego Pagliarulo from the Wilson Center. An aspect that I find particularly striking about this period is that after more than four decades of confrontation, the leaders of both superpowers started to talk in the same terms. I mean, the political discourse, either in the United States and in the Soviet Union, revolved around uh, issues such as human rights, freedom of choice. And yet, if we look more carefully of how policies were implemented, we see that these kind of values were uh, applied rather selectively. I mean, for example, people power was particularly welcome for Central Europe, but then became uh, a source of concern when they should, when, with regard to the crisis in the Soviet Union, or for example, the crisis in the Balkan later, or the crisis in the Gulf even later. I mean, democracy was not part of uh, the solution of the Gulf crisis, for example. So my, what, I would ask you ask, what I would like to ask all commentators is how in Europe, what in your opinion, the study of 1989 and the end of the Cold War tells us about the difficulties of uh, coordinating ideals and strategic priorities in articulating foreign policy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, um, I mean, you've, you've touched on a whole range of issues, and the, the, there's so much more work to be done on 1989, the role of human rights, the role of the CSCE. There's, there's many more topics to be worked on. Uh, the, um, just to pick just one answer, potential answer to your question, there's a little bit of a debate going on now. As you, as you know, because it's the 20th anniversary, there's a lot of literature that has come out. 
And Timothy Garton Ash recently did an essay in the New York Review of Books, and he uh, took strong exception to the argument of a scholar, Stephen Kotkin, that we can understand 1989 simply as the implosion of communist elites. We don't need to look at anything else. We just need to understand how communist elites and the Warsaw Pact imploded end of story. And Timothy Garton Ash says, no, no, there is a, a big, bigger interplay here between the implosion of elites and human rights, freedom of exchange, freedom of ideas, the kinds of things that you've been talking about. We need to understand the push and pull between these things. Uh, it's a fascinating debate. It's just starting. I, I can't give you a simple answer. Um, one, one thing I do actually want to say is that, I meant to say this earlier, the National Security Archive here in Washington is coming out in January with a collection of documents called Masterpieces of History, about 19 1989, so I'd like to recommend that to you and to others who are interested in this topic. Um, so I guess I, I can't really give you a simple answer, but just say that this is clearly an area people are going to investigate. Well, I'm glad Mary said that because I don't have an answer to it either. <laughs> uh, but let, let, let me give you an interesting thing to look at in, in this general regard, and that is compare what happened in China with what happened in the Soviet Union. And what happened, they, they were both seeking the same kinds of things. As I say, Gorbachev was trying to, trying to modernize the Soviet Union, trying to make it a tougher competitor. He was not a Democrat at that time, not by any means. But what he did, the way he did it, he undermined the sinews of the state. And what the reform ended up being political, not economic. So when he had made his political reforms, they had no power left to reform a communist economy. So you remember Yeltsin ended up giving shares for dollars, which was what created the oligarchs. The Chinese, on the other hand, pushed economic reconstruction, pushed you know, I don't care whether a cat's black or white as long as it catches mice. To get rich is glorious, while retaining the tight political controls over the system. Now, which is the better way to go? Thank you. We have time for just a couple more questions. So let me perhaps bundle them, and then we'll give our distinguished panelists a chance to for a final response. So we'll start over here. Yes, Mr. Cole Blazier. Would you uh, describe and evaluate the various contributions of the leading American officials on the end of the Cold War? Okay, and who else would like it? We'll go to the, yeah. I apologize in advance. My question is a little bit broad, but lately I've been reading up that some people, some politicians have commented that the Cold War is not over. And I was curious in recent developments with Russia and Central and Eastern Europe what you commenters might have to say about that. Could you state your name and affiliation? Oh, sorry. Maya Lazar, National Journalism Center. Thank you. And we'll go to the right side, yes. Uh, I'm Pat Harahan. I had a question. I, I didn't hear uh, Professor Sarati in your uh, comments, anything about arms control or arms control treaties, and certainly was part of the time. We have the CFE Treaty, the INF Treaty, the START Treaty, uh, a number of agreements that were made then. Very good. That will have to be it. Mary? All right. Uh, just briefly, um, great questions today. Thank you very much. The um, American officials, it's, a, uh, it, it's obviously quite an interesting story. I'll defer to General Scowcroft since he's one of them and he knew those char characters. I'm not going to answer that one. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're on your own. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, I, I do describe in my book the um, President Bush and the way that he was served by his advisors. Um, Given that we're running out of time, I won't go into detail. Let me just say one thing, though, about the American process. <clears throat> the American process was impressive. Uh, a lot of people wrote very smart policy papers. People disagreed with each other. The papers worked their way up the chain. There would then be a debate between the National Security Council and state. It would get to the president. The president would decide. And so it sort of seemed to me the, to be the way policy making should work, and it was very clear in the American documents. The individual contributions are in the uh, book. Um, let me take the arms control. Yeah, absolutely crucial component. You know, I'm just summarizing very quickly here. The CFE is 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 
integrally correlated into this uh, bargaining over the future size of the German army as part of the negotiations of unification, but the Germans don't want to do that on their own because that means they're going to be singled out. So they want to avoid singularity or singularization, as people say. So uh, the, there are troop limits that are worked in to CFE as part of this bargaining. So that's a very important part of this whole process. Finally, your broader question, that is actually uh, one of the bigger open questions from this time period. Uh, the um, James Baker has said, and I think this is a very wise statement, James Baker has said that the solution to every problem contains within itself the seeds of a future problem. And so the, the solution of prefab, the solution of taking Cold War institutions and perpetuating them into the post-Cold War world was a, a, a solution, a great solution. It worked well. Uh, it prevented violence from occurring and stabilized Europe. Uh, the problem is when you choose w with any solution, it's going to then have consequent issues, right? So one of them is that we have, I wouldn't say we're, we're still in the Cold War or that we have a new Cold War. I think that's an exaggeration. But we have perpetuated a front line with Russia. Now, I, I hasten to add that's not our fault. I mean, there's, you know, takes two, right? So you've got Putin and Russia um, restoring hostility, de-democratizing, and so forth. I'm not blaming, you know, the West for this, but you do have the front line of the Cold War to a certain extent still with us, and so we're seeing the consequences of that daily in debates over Georgia, how we deal with Iran, the geopolitics of energy, a whole host of issues. Thank you. On the role of U.S. officials, I, I, let me just say, uh, President Bush. Uh, was a very unusual man, probably the best prepared president we've ever had in terms of his experiences. He'd been through all this. He knew what kind of an NSC system he wanted because uh, he had seen it from every vantage point. We had strong internal debates on a lot of these issues, but when the president said, okay, I've heard them all, I think we ought to go this way, the debate ended. Uh, and. Uh, that doesn't always happen in the U.S. government. Uh, arms treaties, you know, there's a fascinating aspect to that. We probably should have mentioned it. But we faced a great disparity in Europe. And at home, President Bush was facing calls from the Congress. Where's our peace dividend? Why on earth? Cold War's over. Why on earth do you have all these troops in Europe? Well we could have proposed a 50% reduction on each side. That would put us down to an inconsequential force and the Soviet Union still have massive troops. So we hit upon this idea, let's say we need equal numbers. And then if, if those equal numbers are too high, then we'll reduce jointly, which gave us parity and the ability to maintain security in Europe while making uh, the reductions. The Cold War is not over. I think we made some mistakes, and they were principally later on. Now, that's an easy thing to say, but uh, President Bush, when we revised the NATO charter, uh, we, re we took out all the Cold War terms. Uh, we tried to tell Gorbachev that Nobody won and lost the Cold War. We all won the Cold War. We're all better off. NATO is not designed against the Soviet Union and so on. What we overlooked at the time was the obvious deep humiliation that the Russians had to feel at the change in their status. And so we pursued our plans, our architecture for a Europe whole and free and forgot that the Russians there were, nur were nursing their humiliation. So we pushed the borders of NATO up against the Soviet Union. We abandoned the ABM Treaty, which was one of their keys for it. We, we, we didn't do it to punish the Soviet Union, or the Russians then. We did it just ignoring them. And I think the result in part has been Putin who said, when we were weak, you walked all over us. We've now regained our strength, and we won't put up with it anymore. So I think it, in that sense, and in the sense of the attitudes with uh, some, uh, some attitudes in Eastern Europe, the Cold War 
is it, it's it's not over psychologically it's over in the reality and this is an issue we can deal with thank you thank you both for two brilliant fascinating presentations thank you for sharing your insights and questions let me invite all of you over to a small reception across the hall in the um, dining hall, but not without congratulating again Mary <laughs> on her terrific book, 1989. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're